Ann Carlson and her morning joy bar for 50 miles straight north of town near the metropolis on the ferry, otherwise known as the Mercer. And uh, we are the fourth generation on that farm. That's the farm that my grandfather bought in 1941. And it's the farm I grew up on. And so my husband and I are really honored to be able to take that farm over. We bought the farm last November and uh, moved our farm from south of Cleveland, North Dakota. And uh, if you've never moved your entire household, three toddlers, cows, chickens, sheep, goats, and 138 laying hens. You've just never really lived. So um, we did that last November, and we will never move again. We uh, promised ourselves that. And so my, my talk is titled, Life Began in a Garden, uh, a biblical reference, of course, but it also began in a garden for us. Uh, I was raised on a conventional farm, like I said, the farm that we live on now. Uh, it looks very different now than it did when I was growing up. Uh, I have dug summer fallow. I have tank mixed chemicals. I have uh, applied in hydrus, I have ran a feedlot, and uh, I'm recovering. So uh, I've done all those things. I grew up as the oldest daughter, uh, which meant I was the family slave. And uh, so from the time I was 11, I farmed alongside my dad. I started driving tractor when I was eight. I'm sure there's many OSHA laws that were broken, but uh, I've been farming most of my life, farming next to my dad uh, since I was 11. Um, to start with, uh, we got married in 2007, and uh, John had a quarter of land south of Cleveland. Part of that was in the CRP program. He was working full-time as a machinist in Jamestown, and uh, we were pregnant six weeks after we got married, so it was game on, figure out your stay-at-home mom job. And so I spent that first winter just dating and researching uh, how does one take a, just a quarter of land and make you know, somewhat of a stay-at-home mom income that our family can do together, and uh, I can make some money. And so we started with a garden. Uh, I gardened all my life. I was a teacher for a while, and my summer job was a professional gardener. I gardened for other people. And so we started with a vegetable CSA, which also sold at the farmer's market. Um, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, and so our customers bought a share of our, from our produce, our farm product. And so we did uh, 22 shares, which meant we fed 22 families for 16 weeks, starting in June, ending sometime in October. And so this is just a sample of the share. You get a variety of different vegetables. They also got a newsletter every week that told them what was in their box, what they could do with it, how to prepare stuff like kohlrabi, you know, they maybe had never worked with before. And so uh, we started with that, and uh, it was going really well. We were sold out every year. I had a waiting list. You know, people were just loving it. I was loving it. It was great part-time work for me had the off season to kind of relax in the winter. And then uh, the recession hit, and John was working for a company that made airplane cargo systems. Well, when the economy's not good, no one's buying airplanes. So no one was buying airplane cargo systems. So John was laid off uh, in February of 2000, looks like the year 10. And uh, if you're gonna get laid off, and you're a farmer, February's a really good time. You can plan, you can have your panic attack, and then you can plan. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, John also grew up on a, on a conventional farm. He had no livestock, so I tell him, well, honey, that really wasn't a real farm. Uh, a real farm was livestock. And uh, so he, he had a conventional background. I had a conventional background. Uh, we knew we weren't going to farm that way. So what are we going to do? So uh, we had just seen a movie, and uh, Joel Salton happened to be in it. And so I Googled Joel Salton. I've heard of him before. And uh, he wrote books, and I read books, so it was like a match made in heaven. So <laughs> I ordered a couple books, and uh, we got started. So uh, John got started in pastured poultry. Those are our broilers. The first year, we started with 112. Uh, we now do uh, 900. And then we, of course, added some laying hens. Those are black astrolorps. All of our livestock utilizes these nets from Premier. Poultry netting, we use it for everything. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty valuable tool on our farm. Those are black astral pens, out uh, grazing. And then of course, we also had to add in some turkeys. So we have turkeys. Turkeys are our biggest seller. We direct market every product that we have on the farm. I'm sold out of turkeys first. Uh, turkeys are immensely popular. And then uh, we also have Icelandic sheep. Uh, we tried Icelandics and, uh, oh. Paul, help me out. Your wool is wonders. 
Katagas. I almost called him Kardashian for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried, uh, so we tried the Kardashian. We tried the, the, the Wolves Wonders, and we like our Icelandics better. And so right now we're running a uh, herd of Icelandics. Um, we're drive marketing for Wolf this year, which is, is a new adventure for us. But we have the Icelandics, they're 100% grass fed sheep. Um, we really like them. Uh, they're delicious as well as beautiful. Uh, we have some dairy goats for a while, we were milking those, that's my daughter. And uh, then the best Father's Day or Mother's Day present ever, uh, we got two dairy cows. And so uh, we sold the goats because John said we don't need to milk everything. And so <laughs> now I have two, two dairy cows. Uh, we also pasture pork, those are our, our pigs from the first year. Uh, again, we started with eight pigs, uh, next year we'll do close to 40. And uh, those are the hardest workers on the farm, I'll talk more about them in just a minute. And uh, because we always got to try something new, well, I always have to try something new, John limits. I'm the big dreamer, John is the voice of reason and we end up in the middle. So uh, this year we did geese, and those were a big seller too. I put a sign up in the farmer's market, asked me about Christmas goose, and they were gone that day. So uh, we did geese, they mowed my lawn uh, for the summer, uh, mowed and fertilized, and uh, warned us of any predators. So that's what, what it looks like now. Uh, we got a lot going on. The news around Mercer uh, last summer, because we were grazing and everything kind of rotates around, and, and at this point everything was kind of up near the road, which we all know that's a recipe for disaster. And uh, so the word going around town was that Carlson's were running a petting zoo. Because apparently if you have more than one species of livestock, you're now in petting zoo category. So uh, it's, it's the petting zoo. We eat them. We don't pet them. <laughs> and so some basic tenets of our farm. The first one is that the, the family stays together. So we want to do things that our kids can do with us. Uh, we have the five, the four, and the three-year-old. Uh, we want animals that the kids can be around. Uh, we want to have equipment the kids can be around. It was a real wake-up point for my husband when he was still conventionally farming a little bit with his dad and uh, was out fixing the sprayer when our daughter was just two years old, our oldest daughter. And, uh, he got really frustrated because she wouldn't leave the nozzles alone, and he knew she couldn't touch them. And so he said after an afternoon of yelling, don't touch it, don't touch it, he thought maybe it shouldn't even be here if my two-year-old can't touch it. And so uh, we, we frame all of our, our farming decisions based on the fact that our, if our kids can be involved. Uh, the second one is that the farm will regenerate the landscape and provide nutrient-dense foods at fair prices. Uh, the fair prices part is pretty important to us. And we sell direct to families, to about 80 families that we're feeding right now. And uh, it's important for me that they get a fair price. And lastly, we will build community. Um, we'll work with our neighbors and uh, build community. So let's talk a little bit about gardening. Like I said, I'm not a professional gardener. I don't know professional anything. It's probably a weed puller. So this is a traditional garden. Uh, I'm really embarrassed to say that was our garden last year. and. Uh, the orange steaks are for some vegetable trials that we're working on uh, with the Farm Breeding Club here in Northern Plains Sustainable Ag. And so those are two trials that we're doing for them. When you look at a traditional garden, it's usually a warm spot. You know, when you go to the farm, that's the garden spot. And uh, this was in the, the garden spot. This is where I had gardened as a young child. That is where the garden shelves go, right? It's where grandma planted peas, and by God, that's where we plant peas. So it's always in one spot. There's no rotation because that is the pea spot. Uh, maybe we've added fertility. Uh, once in a while, Grandpa would get the itch and dump a load of manure on, and guess what he dumped with manure? Weeds. And then Grandma cursed it in the next year. So we, we have maybe we'll add fertility. Uh, a lot of chemical treatments. When I talk to people about gardening and go to gardening workshops, we're just talking about all the stuff they're going to add to it. Uh, City gardeners, they love their miracle grow. You know, well, I, I'm a very natural gardener. I just use miracle grow. <laughs> Dear Lord. Okay. So you're going to find a lot of chemical treatments. Um, it's constant tillage. Uh, you go to the garden shows, it's tillers and hoes and weeders and all sorts of stuff. Uh, if you want black dirt, the blacker the better. You want that stuff black, nothing grown unless it's in a row and lots of water usage. When I teach gardening classes, number one question I get, how much should I water? How much do you water? I don't water anything. I don't. This is 
my favorite farmer says, I'm not running a bed and breakfast here. I don't run it for my, my animals, and I'm certainly not running it for carrots. <laughs> so, uh, the traditional garden is, is very labor intensive. Uh, the reason we don't do a vegetable CSA anymore is because they have three small children, and they eat a lot of vegetables more than I can grow. So, uh, it's very labor intensive. So, uh, I have a couple of gardens that I'm going to share with you that are friends of ours. Uh, the first one is down in Fullerton, North Dakota, uh, Prairie Road Organic Farm. It's a total family. Has anyone been there? I'm proud of you've been there. Right on. Okay. Uh, David Podal and his brother Dan, uh, their wives and families, uh, farm together at Prairie Road Organic Farm. And when you come over the hill, kind of, there's not a whole lot of hills near Fullerton, but there's a little one. You come up over the hill, and there's a sea of corn beans. And in the middle of this sea of corn beans, there's this green oasis. And that green oasis is Prairie Road Organic Farm. So people ask, well, how do you get to Podal's? Just drive, you'll see it. It's a beacon. And so they, uh, they've had a no-till garden for almost 40 years. And uh, some management that they do, they utilize June cut hay as mulch. Uh, they try to go out the first, second week of June and use that June cut hay and snow seed heads, very clean. And that's what they're going to use as mulch. They square bale that. Uh, their rows are always in the same place, but they're moving with triads. So they'll have three rows of legumes, let's say two rows of beans, row of peas, and they'll move that triad the next year, and so these three rows are moving as, the, as part of their crop rotation. Uh, they hand plant this, and there's, there's almost no water usage. In 40 years, David says less than one hand he's watered. So in, in 40 years, he's watered less than five times. And there's almost no weeding. Uh, if you see a weed, it pulls easily out through the mulch and uh, there's very little weeds. It's, it's an oasis, it's beauty. This is onions, they raised in uh, Dakota Tears. Onion is, is an onion that they bred there, and uh, that's the seed, seed uh, plot for their Dakota Tears onion. This is another picture of, of the rose and the mulch, and uh, it's a really neat way to garden. I love it. Second garden I wanted to show you, some of you have seen the slide before. This is Brown's Ranch over in, uh, just out of town. Uh, Paul sent me this photo. And uh, all the species are, are sewn together. It's mechanically planted versus the hand planting uh, that the Podal farm used. There's no, no additional water. They're not out there weeding. Of course there's no tillage. It's cold, but it's not that cold. And uh, the, the only problem I have with this is as a market gardener, I need to be able to harvest and, and know what I've got out there. And so this type of setup uh, challenges my timely and accurate harvest. Uh, it's hard enough to find tomatoes, but if I have to look around the kale and carrots and stuff too, that, that's an additional challenge. So uh, issues with, with every one of them, of course, as with anything. Uh, challenges to no-till, particularly on Corn and Joy Farms, that we're just uh, taking over. Perennial weeds are a huge challenge. Holy mackerel. Uh, I don't think there's anything as a weed, but Canadian thistle comes right there. Uh, our biggest problem is Canadian thistle. It's everywhere on this farm. Uh, it's been in CRP for 15 and 17 years, and the yard had been abandoned for about two years, and so our, our Canadian thistle is, is our number one problem. Uh, wormwood, I don't consider a problem. I put it up there because people would consider it a bad weed. We love it. Uh, it's the natural wormer for our ruminants. Um, pigs will eat it, chickens will not, uh, but, but pigs will eat it. And so we worm, we worm with wormwood in the spring, and uh, they keep it in check for us. So I'm not, I'm not too upset about that. Uh, Quack grass is crazy. We have thick mats of it. It's our number one forage. And the bindweed. The, the bindweed uses our Canadian thistle stalks as, as its pillar. Mm -hmm. So we've got plenty of that, but locally the sheep love it. So here are our concerns. Uh, that's Pale Face, that's one of our gilts. Um, she works really hard, like I said earlier. The pigs are the hardest workers on our farm. Uh, they're also the biggest consumers on our farm. Uh, pigs are an omnivore, they'll graze, but uh, dry sows are about the only thing you can 100% graze. Everybody else needs a little, a little grain supplement. Young pigs uh, will take 20 to 30% of their diet forage. The older the pig gets, the more that they'll take. 
our fat hogs will go about 50% forage. And uh, right now they're they're still in the still in the lot due to a variety of circumstances. But they're going through hay like nobody's business. So they're still they're still eating a fair amount of forage even though they're off the pasture. So pale face, uh, that's a piglet in front, that's our first generation of chemical free pigs. Is that young piglet? Uh, so our, our concerns were we have a large garden requirement. I can a lot. My husband were here, he'd tell you if he leaves anything later on in the kitchen, chances are I'll can it. And so uh, we have a large garden requirement. Uh, we feed some families uh, through our church and stuff. And so we have, we have a large garden requirement. We have severe running of a weed problem, like I told you. I would love to mulch. I would love to do a podal type style garden. But that Canadian thistle would just say, thank you for the blanket, and it would destroy us. So we've got to get our perennial weed problem in check before we start, start mulching. Uh, we want to decrease heavy metal usage. Uh, we want a more natural approach. We don't want to use chemicals and uh, utilize more natural approaches versus mechanical approaches. We want to utilize our existing infrastructure. I don't want to buy anything. I want to make sure I use the tools that I have. I want to increase land utilization and productivity. Um, People assume that when we bought my parents' farm that we were getting bigger. Bought a, you know, another farm, you must be bigger. We're actually smaller. We went from a quarter of land to now we're operating on less than 100 acres. And so uh, we, we've actually downsized uh, our land. Uh, we want to use as little fossil fuel and labor as possible to tackle this. So this is our Canadian thistle. This is a once over uh, by the flurd in this Canadian thistle patch. We graze our, our cows and our sheep together, they call the flirt. So we graze the flirt together. Um, they'll nip the tops off, blossoms and stuff, but they won't tackle the big, the big stalks. So uh, we let them go through and uh, graze off the top. Then we turn the pigs in, that's the back of our, the back of our sow, Patsy Swine. And uh, so Patsy and, and crew were in there. The pigs will graze off first, and so big concern with people know that we pasture the pigs, oh, they just must tear it up, they just tear it up. They don't. Uh, they'll graze first. And uh, there's no sound quite like a herd of pigs being turned into fresh pasture. They're chomping and smacking and they just love it. So if you don't want them to turn it over, take them out right here. And depending on how big your paddock size is, how big your pigs are, and I can't give you a, this is two days and no longer. I can't tell you that. You just got to be out there watching. Uh, they're not going to start turning it until they've ate the top off. Pigs are very efficient. They're going to eat the grass first, and then they're going to turn it up. So then we want them to work harder. So we want them to turn that over. Uh, they love Canadian thistle. Canadian thistle is like candy to them. Uh, they will dig down to their roots, and they'll pull them out, and they'll like root dangling out like this, like a cigar, and they'll just gnaw on it. They love it. So when we run the pigs through, uh, they'll turn that quack grass sod over, and they're just thick, mad, and yuck. They'll turn that over and break that down. They'll go after those Canadian thistle roots and really destroy it, really work hard for us. Um, we run the pigs through our bale grazing. Um, we round bale graze. And so we run the pigs through uh, the bale grazing in the spring. Again, we're making them work. They're turning that over. Um, people ask John, well, what's your waste on bale grazing? None. Whatever's left when the cows are gone, the sheep are gone, the pigs eat. So uh, there's very little, very little waste left. And so the pigs work really hard turning over those bad spots for us. So we use them in targeted areas, really bad weed spots, things we want uh, them to work hard on. So this is one of the areas I told you that we ran a feed lot, so we've got, we've got a lot of paddock pens, corral pens. Uh, we use them as paddocks in our grazing system. They're, they're worthless as feed lot, feed lot now. So this is one that was solid quack grass and Canadian thistle. And so we put the pigs in there and really made them work hard. Um, left them in there, made them turn it over. And uh, afterwards, John dug the six foot piece of harrow out of the pile, poked it to the back of the farm all and just tootled around in there and just leveled it out in the pig mouth a little bit. And so the ration that the pigs were on at the time uh, had some whole canola and whole wheat in it. And so pigs being highly efficient, they seeded the cover crop for us. And so we had a canola, wheat, cover crop. And then we went in on the 4th of July and seeded squash, pumpkins, uh, flint corn, what else was in there? Uh, just seeded that stuff. And we had, uh, seeded on the 4th of July, we had absolutely zero confidence it would produce human food. 
but we wanted to grow as much of that as we could because we knew the pigs would come back in. And so we grew that all out and it was just a, a jungle in there. Uh, the cover crop of canola and wheat kind of helped uh, get that stuff going. And so that grew up, we didn't graze it until the fall. And turn the pigs in there, you turn the pigs in, you couldn't even see them. It was just this jungle of stuff. So we turned the pigs in and they had that all chewed down in about three days. So we put pigs into a new paddock. They don't touch the feeder for about the first day. And the bigger the pigs are, the longer they stay away from the feeder. And so uh, we can really utilize a lot of forage on the farm in some marginal areas when we put those pigs in there. So that's, a, that's our garden spot for this next year. We're abandoning the traditional garden spot. You can all have a second morning for that. And he has abandoned grandma's traditional garden spot. And so this is gonna be the garden spot this next year. The pigs went through in the fall, turned it back over for us, flushed the weed bank, we're done. So we're gonna go into there in the spring and that's gonna be the garden spot. Um, we're gonna plant it. We're gonna do our traditional garden in there. Um, we're gonna use hay and stuff with mulch as much as we can and uh, that's going to be the garden spot there's some of the vines growing and we're also going to utilize vertical space uh, how many don't know you to raise your hand how many people have corral panels that look like that we will get a lot of them advantage of living in a feedlot uh, we're going to use that vertical space so we're going to put some pole beans up there some tall telephone peas we're going to run our tomatoes next to that we're going to run the cucumbers up there and so we're going to utilize every square foot of that, that barnyard. Uh, everybody else is out grazing, we might as well make use of the space. So that's what's gonna happen there. Uh, when we graze the pigs in through, uh, pigs need a, a fair amount of shade uh, during the summer months, and so we kind of paddock off from our barn system. And so this is one paddock that they just got out of. We didn't, we didn't make them turn this completely over. But John doesn't like to have bare soil, and so he goes out with his early bird cedar, He's got a, this year I think he did a seven way mix, he'll probably do more next year. He walks around his early birds here. And then we had that dry spell, so then we turned in some sprinkler, we turned some water on it just to get it started. And so we grew that up, and so we can graze that with the flur, we can bring the pigs back in. Uh, a lot of different things we can do with that in the fall when they come in back off the pasture. So we want to make sure that, that we're growing uh, anything and everything. It's not garden, it's, it's cover crop in the, in the corral system. Uh, any comments, questions, or concerns? Uh, we have a farm website, we're on farms on Facebook. Um, my email address is up there. If something piqued your interest today, um, don't be afraid to shoot me an email and say, I think you're insane, how are you doing this? Uh, I'll be happy to do that. Our farm is open uh, at all times for tours. Uh, stop by, give us a call, um, we're there. I've given a tour on Christmas Eve. So if you think, oh, they don't have time, I've taken time on Christmas Eve. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say, uh, the theme that we had was getting started. And a uh, the real passion of mine is getting people started in farming. And I think there are a lot of what most people would term marginal areas out there. Um, abandoned farm stands. Uh, with, with 60 foot drills, we've got you know, a three acre corner that we can't get in and turn around in. Keep your eyes open to those areas. Uh, John and I drive the back roads. He's a big lover of back roads, and so we drive the back roads, and we'll sit there and count the farms. How many farms between Mercer and Harvey are, have abandoned farmsteads that obviously there's some source of water. It's a well at some point. Was there somebody who was living there? So we got a source of water. We've got you know a farmstead, maybe in a shelter area. They have a shelter belt built. If somebody's not living there. Imagine if you could go to that landowner and say, "I'll give you cash rent for that farmstead, and you can put a garden on." Uh, John always jokes that I make more on, on two acres of garden than he makes, or, or made, on 200 acres of soybeans. So gardens are extremely profitable. The market is there. Uh, in North Dakota, we have a huge, untapped, what I like to call institutional market. Um, farm to school program. We have hotels, like the Ramcota. Um, in Bismarck alone, Bismarck Public Schools serves 8,000 meals a day to their school kids. They don't want to buy from someone who's got five extra tomatoes in their backyard. They want to buy from a serious gardener and they can provide some serious capital uh, to somebody who started farming. Um, too many people think you need 2,000 acres and $200,000 to get started farming. I argue that you need $200 and two acres and you can get started uh, with gardening or chickens or whatever. 
So uh, don't be afraid to do, start with something, anything. Uh, how many of us are working a job to support our farming habit? How many of us have a spouse who's working off the farm to support our farming habit? How many of us have kids who want to come home and we're looking at the bottom line going, I don't know how he's going to come home. I don't know how she's going to come home. There are a lot of ways that we can make money and it doesn't mean putting our neighbor out of business to do it. So, thank you.